we'll talk briefly about an Old Testament character that maybe we don't think about too often. But here in Isaiah, the seventh chapter, <clears throat> we have a king. Starting in verse 1 of Isaiah 7, In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz. You and Shir Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, pay attention, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is reason. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. And if you don't hear anything else I say, please read this for yourself. This very end of the verse 9. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. That's a really powerful statement. And that's where this lesson uh, is basically derived from. And so we're going to use then now the New Testament later on to kind of understand what does that mean to be firm in our faith using the scriptures. But just kind of a brief history and setup of what's happening here. You know, we have this uh, king, Ahaz. He's, he is a... Uh, king of Judah, which is the southern region. And if you would, go with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, and we'll learn a little bit more about him and his situation. So 2 Kings 16, and we'll read the first four verses. Here we have Ahaz. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, King of Judah began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and on every green tree. Would you want Ahaz to be your friend? The verses in describing some of the actions say he's despicable, burning his own son. He does not do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. He didn't walk as his father David had done. And so, who was Ahaz? Well, he was the 12th king after the division. And he is reigning in Jerusalem, which we saw there in Isaiah. He's a descendant of David. Such here we see that he is not walking in the ways of his father. So that's a, a, a marker of him being a descendant. And he reigned from 730 to 715 B.C. He, of course, did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. And that is a common phrase throughout the, this time frame. Uh, all the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom, Ephraim, uh, often referred to as, none of them were good. They always had this to say 
as an identification. They did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And so as we go through this, we can see that this is an example of what not to do. This is a contrast to what we should be doing. The kings of Syria and Israel, they come and they want to wage war against Jerusalem. They, they want to go up against him. And so where does Ahaz then place his dependencies? Where does he look for help, his security? He looks for the king of Assyria to help him. And so we can see from his example, he's making bad decisions time and time again through his leadership. He's not doing what he should be. He's not firm in his faith in the God, the one God who is going to help him. As we kind of read back in Isaiah, he's saying it's not going to happen. It's not going to stand. And Ahaz continually just ignores the prophets of God. And so that's kind of the setup of, of what we're, we're, we're here to kind of talk about. And so now we're going to flip into some of the New Testament. But as you can see, Ahaz is being told it won't come to pass. This shall not stand. The, the kings of Syria and Israel will come against you and they will not win. And we kind of come back to that same verse in Isaiah. If you are not firm in your faith, you will not be firm at all. And so when we think about a house, start at the foundation if you are looking to buy a home and there's a hole in the sidewall down where the the foundation is, is is built you're going to question that you go inside the house and there's there's rot on the floor and you can see how it maybe is uneven and maybe there's some water marks and none of it's firm are you going to buy that house is that what you're looking for? Do you want to spend your money on that? Maybe you want to fix it up and so then it's okay, but I want you to not, not ready for that. When we look for things like confidence, if you're interviewing for a job and you waffle on a question, you know, what are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? And you have nothing to say. Then you're not firm in your understanding of yourself. You're not firm in your stature, your position in life. And so then they will not have confidence in you to complete the job that they are looking for to be accomplished. And so when we look at this word firm, we're going to look at it in the New Testament context. And thinking again about Ahaz, though, he didn't have faith. And so what good did it do him to burn his son to an idol? He had no faith. He burned his son. Despicable. He created an alliance with a pagan empire such as Assyria to get that momentary security without faith. God had already told him it won't happen but he sought to get help elsewhere. He ignored God's prophet when he told them that. And so he looks for security in other ways. We know that Jerusalem was surrounded by walls. Did he have faith in that? No, because he went to Assyria still. And so he was not firm in anything. And so let's go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 6 kind of kicks us off here in the New Testament of being firm and having our faith firm. 11 and verse 6 and says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. you got to start there first. The great I am exists. He is alive. He is well. He is in control, he exists. And we have to know that. We have to acknowledge that. We have to be confident in that. There are so many forces that say the exact opposite of this particular statement. We have a term for it. Atheists. We have to know that he exists and that he rewards those 
who seek Him. So we have to have these two things to be, at least be pleasing to God. But going a little further, we have to be firm in our faith and let's go now into Psalm. Psalm 119. <clears throat> Psalm 119. I have a few verses here to read that really shore up this idea that we get from the idea of being firm and the first verse that I point out here is going to work, use the word fixed. And so some of these verses now that we are going to go through, I've just briefly pointed out some of the strong words that I want us to focus on as we read through these verses. Psalm 119, 89 through 96. Forever. Started out strong right there. Forever, O Lord. We've identified who we're talking about. Your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours. Save me. For I have sought your precepts, the wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. And so you can see and you can hear in the words being portrayed here, firmly fixed, forever, established, stands fast. This essentially guides us into what firm in our faith is. Going a little further, back into Psalm 112. Psalm 112, verses 6 and 7. Here it says, For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Are you afraid of bad news? It's kind of an interesting statement there. In, in the times that we live today, kind of opening up into 2020 and coming through about a year and a half later, there isn't a whole lot firm about our schedules. There isn't a whole lot firm about the economy and the leaders and what they're going to do next. And it's just a hodgepodge of what is going on. And that's all physical. That's all stuff that we can separate from our spiritual lives. But it's sometimes very, very hard to do that. We can be shaken. We can be moved out of righteousness. You can see that back in verse 6. For the righteous will never be moved. The righteous in spiritual, in their spiritual life. But we can be moved if we waver, if we become unrighteous, if we become unloyal, if we become overcome with sin. But you can see there, never be moved and we can be trusting in the Lord. All right, now we're going to go into the, the New Testament. But if you would turn with me now to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, 15 through 19. <clears throat> Here Paul, writing to the young preacher Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, not being firm or confident in our faith. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal 
The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And there we have the word being used again. Firm. God's firm foundation stands. Ahaz, your kingdom will not lose this war. King of Assyria, can you help me? You see how we can use Ahaz's mindset and example to teach us what not to think, what not to do. As Paul writes to Timothy here, do your best to present yourself to God. A worker who's approved, not being ashamed. Rightly handling the word. Avoiding certain things that will not produce firm faith results. He points out two men, Hymenaeus and Philetus. They swerved from the truth. That's not being firm. Have you swerved into an accident in a car before? You lose control. Paul is saying, don't lose control. Don't swerve. Be firm in the word. Be firm. Because God's firm foundation stands. And we're going to see those words time and time again through the pattern out of the New Testament. So turn with me again to 2 Thessalonians. Here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 14 and 15. He says, To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Stand firm. Hold the traditions. And this traditions, uh, these are the things that he's referring to. These aren't man-made traditions. These are the things that he's taken from Christ to be preaching the gospel to so that they are approved so that they are in the pattern of soundness, so that they are firm in their faith when they are worshiping God. They're standing firm and they're holding. Continuing on, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Starting there in verse 10, we have finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So again, we're not talking about things of physical nature. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt. And he continues on through the explanation of that armor that we've uh, pretty recently discussed in some of our Bible classes. But you can see here again that same pattern of standing and being firm and he's explaining through the context what we're going to be standing firm against and what the tools are that we're going to be using to stand. And so he uses the armor example there where we can be standing and we can be firm and we can be like a soldier and we can fight. We're not without weapons. Going further on in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Talking about now Satan. There in verse 8. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. How? Firm in your faith. You see how important this is now? That we get this idea in our head about what firm 
being in our faith is? How do we resist the devil who constantly wants to attack us, who constantly wants us to not be firm? He wants us to be rotten. He wants us to dis dissolve our relationship with God altogether. He wants us to fall to pieces. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And so he brings that collective unity to the Christians here to say you're not the only ones who are going to be suffering. And so you can take comfort in that. But the tools that we are using here are faith. And that we can use others amongst the brotherhood who are fighting that same fight. Who are using the same tools that we're instructed to do from these passages that we've seen. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7 and 27, going back to the same book we're studying currently in our Sunday morning class, Philippians 1, 27. Paul here writes to the Christians at Philippi, only let your manner of life be worthy of, the, of Christ, of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. That same idea that we kind of got out in 1 Peter, now we have even more locally contrived here. Now, what are we doing? We're striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We're standing firm in one spirit. We're unified in doctrine. We're unified in the love of Christ. We're unified in what we're preaching together that we know is true and right. And we're reaching out to the community. And we're trying to get more souls for Christ so they can stand firm as well with us. I need you. And you need me. That's what Paul is saying. Those are the tools that we can use to become firm and standing firm and being unified and striving side by side. And finally, our last verse this morning is Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Here it says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And so I hope that this lesson will help us to understand what it means to be firm in our faith. And think again back to Ahaz. What good did it do him to constantly ignore God? What good did it do him to burn his son? Despicable acts. Going back to Isaiah chapter 7 verse 9 the very end if you are not firm in faith you will not be firm at all we need to take heart to those words take heart to the lessons that we've seen from Paul and from other writers of the New Testament that we are going to be tested time and time again in this life we are going to suffer if we are living righteously. How will, how will you react to those temptations? How will you react to Satan's darts to make you like jello? We have to be firm in our faith, confident that God will protect us, guide us, and He has loved us so much that He sent His Son so that we could have hope that we could have His love and that we can reciprocate that love that He sent His Son to us, that we can love Him as much as He loved us. 
If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, the Hebrew writer here, he says, For if we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, as it has said, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Do not harden your heart like Ahaz. Do not harden your heart and think that your way is going to be the way that takes you into some better position or place. That thinking is not firm. There is no confidence in your and my own steps. But with God, with His Word guiding us, we can succeed. We can be approved. We can be pleasing to God. And so I'll end with that note. If we... If you have in some way sinned and you have already become a child of God and you need to make your life right, that opportunity is now to become firm again in your relationship, in your faith with God. If you need to become a child of God, you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you need to repent and, and confess and do those acts that will put you into a good relationship with Christ, with God. I ask that you come now as we stand and sing.